labs. Yeah, thanks for having me here and inviting me. Uh, so as Lucio mentioned, or said, this basically is about the formation and coalescence of uh, cosmological supermassive black hole binaries and supermassive star collapse. So the essential idea is we have a, a massive fluid body. Um, as I will show you later, this guy is um, unstable against exosymmetric or is unstable to exosymmetric modes and develops uh, or fragments during the collapse and uh, eventually forms a black hole binary. So that's basically the outline of my talk. So first I will give some motivation. I uh, <coughs> talk about different formation scenarios of supermassive black holes um, and supermassive stars. I will briefly review the computational modeling that we have. Uh, Lucio asked me to provide some very basic ideas of how three plus, num uh, three plus one numerical relativity works. The numerics, especially I also want to highlight uh, our multi-patch techniques and uh, gravitational wave extraction. And then finally, I will uh, talk about uh, the simulations, remnant properties, and the gravitational wave detectability. All right, so this is the problem. At z equals 7, um, we already have, have observational evidence that we have uh, supermassive black holes with the mass of 10 to the 9 uh, solar masses. And the question is, uh, how is that possible? How could at that uh, time, when the universe was less than one giga year old, uh, uh, already have formed a, a 10 to the 9 solar mass supermassive black hole. Now, different uh, scenarios. Um, one, for instance, is based on this uh, hierarchical merger scenario where you assume that uh, you have um, galaxies and they contain a central black hole. And as the galaxies merge, the central uh, um, black hole merge. And that means that um, eventually you end up with a very massive black hole at the center of the galaxy. But the trouble is you don't have enough time at z equals 7. Uh, that takes much longer. Another scenario is the, the growth via um, accretion from the collapse of a, a population 3 star. These guys have a mass of about 100 solar masses. Um, and um, if you do the math, then you find that um, if you want this um, initial seed black hole to grow to supermassive scales, scales within one giga year, then it must accrete from the surrounding gas cloud at at least the um, uh, Eddington rate. Um, but the trouble with that is that you develop strong radiative feedback, and that ultimately limits the growth rate. So um, it also doesn't seem to be possible to form supermassive black holes within, uh, yeah, at z equals 7 with this kind of mechanism already. So another idea, which seems more exotic, but which uh, got a more, bit more uh, get, got more popular recently, is uh, the formation of a supermassive star. A supermassive star would offer sufficient seed mass. Once this guy collapses, you have already a pretty massive black hole, and that can indeed, via accretion, uh, grow to supermassive scales, um, and would yeah would be would be uh, would could explain the existence of. Uh, of supermassive black holes already at z equals 7. So the basic properties of uh, this kind of star are that, that it has a mass which is larger than uh, 10 to the 4 uh, solar masses, is, um, up to even 10 to the 8 solar masses. It has a very low metallicity because it's one of the, it belongs to the first stars. Um, eventually in the core it, has, uh, it is sustained by hydrogen and, and helium burning and it has, has a convective envelope. And this guy is completely radiation pressure dominated. That means it can be modeled by a gamma equals 4 third uh, uh, poly polytrope. That will become uh, important later because we are uh, only simulating polytropes um, in the end. Um, it evolves on the kelvin helmholtz time scale. It means it cools and contracts. And uh, during the evolution, the central density um, uh, rises, increases. And uh, um, this guy ultimately um, uh, evolves to the onset of gravitational collapse. So all those properties were already discussed in uh, part, Partly, I think most, I mean, this, this property here uh, definitely was discussed uh, already in 1963. I think uh, these additions here are uh, part of later studies, but um, I'm not a total expert in all the different details on how this uh, or who discovered what at what kind of time. So, But certainly, uh, this evolved over time. Yeah. So I'm not clear if this is the setup that you choose, or 
or this is what we should imagine to be the setup in general for supernova? Yeah, this should be the, uh, the setup in general. Uh, what we in the end choose, and I will explain that later, is really that we uh, uh, impose that um, the star is, is completely modeled by a, a gamma equals four thirds polytrope. So we neglecting all the microphysics. Um, I will explain what kind of consequences that ha has. Um, yeah, but for now we just, you know, we just uh, look at this property here. So uh, once, once, you know, once um, the star has evolved to the onset of collapse, uh, it becomes dynamically unstable. It starts to uh, collapse, and um, depending on mass rotation and metallicity, um, you can either form a supermassive black hole because it continues to collapse. There's nothing which prevents the collapse. Uh, or um, depending, if you, if you have uh, enough metallicity um, or uh, uh, more rotation or a low mass, then uh, it becomes likely that uh, thermal bounce occurs. And this thermal bounce uh, happens because uh, hydrogen and, uh, hydrogen and uh, uh, helium um, is burned in this hot uh, carbon-nitrogen oxy oxygen cycle which uh, releases, um, rele uh, releases a, th a tremendous amount of thermal energy, and that basically uh, um, makes the star expand and leads to a powerful supernova explosion on the order of 10 to the 4 beta. Um, 1 beta is 10 to the 51 ergs, for those who don't know. So uh, another important aspect is that uh, um, if you, once you uh, reach temperatures of above 10 to the 9 Kelvin, uh, it becomes pretty likely that electron-positron pairs are created that uh, uh, causes an additional loss of pressure and even accelerates the collapse. And this, this kind of, um, uh, yeah, this process becomes, becomes important for us later because effectively it means that um, the, the adiabatic uh, index gamma, which we assume to be uh, four-thirds for a radiation pressure-dominated uh, fluid body, is effectively lowered below four-thirds. No, the nuclear burning is completely unimportant for, for uh, these stars. They really evolve only on the Kelvin Helmholtz time scale. So nuclear burning time scales are much longer. The remnants in each case are what exactly? What is the mass of the black hole on the horizon point? Uh, that, um, yeah, that depends on the initial mass, of course. But for instance, in our model that we are looking at, 85% uh, of the, um, of the uh, initial mass is ending up in the black hole. And I uh, show you movies and well, I guess the, the, what is the oh. That's not the question, quite the question I asked. Which, what's the mass of the black hole in the horizon forms? Um, well, we can look at this. I, I don't have the initial e collapse. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Uh, so the first time um, I have it, I have a diagram, but I ha don't have the number handy right now, but uh, I'll tell you why I'm asking that question in a moment. And what's the remnant in the case of the, large, the very large supernova explosion? Uh, there's no remnant. It, everything is basically just, I mean, it just drives a powerful explosion, and you have uh, mass that is ejected. I'm not aware of any, any uh, uh, remnant that may form, so it's completely disrupted. And you can actually demonstrate that happens? Uh, no. We are, we are completely focusing on that, on that aspect here. What's the basis? This, this here. Oh, this is this is so basic. What's the basis for the statement of nothing, no remnant remains, if you haven't actually calculated it? Well, I mean, these guys have calculated it. Want okay, and they find no remnant. They, they find no remnant, exactly. Okay, I'll, so now I'll tell you why I asked the question about the mass of the initial black hole, <laughs> which is that to a certain degree, your structure strongly resembles one of very super Eddington accretion with low angular momentum. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if you're so confident that radiation forces will disrupt super Eddington accretion, um, why they aren't equally significant here? Well, um, I'm not confident that they completely disrupt <laughs> the accretion. <laughs> Well, I, I'm not sure if I uh, understand your qu question right now. I, let, let me let me continue. Maybe maybe it becomes. Uh, uh, let, let's talk uh, afterwards. Did you say what, what are the masses of these stars? Ten to the four. Uh, ten to the four up to ten to the eight solar masses. So they're creating pairs. So is it a pair of production? 
but, the, but, all the, but all the physics would happen. This is just super super Eddington accretion, right? But that always happens in super Eddington accretion. Okay, well. <laughs> well, I'm. Uh, you know, you know, the thing is, I'm not an expert on uh, on all these uh, different formation scenarios. For me, in the very end, it's just a, just a, a polytropic fluid body, and I, I investigate the gravitational collapse of that guy. So, but you know, this is the motivation. So, um, so, so the production side of uh, of uh, of these supermassive uh, stars uh, could potentially be. Uh, Happening in a in a uh, in a di in the direct collapse of a primordial gas cloud, um, so re you require rapid accretion rates uh, down to the center of um, of the uh, um, primordial gas cloud, and in order to have these high uh, accretion rates, you have to avoid uh, fragmentation uh, during the collapse of the of the gas cloud, and also the uh, angular momentum barrier uh, must be overcome, you know, because the primordial gas cloud may uh, initially have uh, um, uh, substantial amounts of angular momentum, and as it collapses, uh, you eventually reach the angular momentum barrier, and that needs to be overcome. Otherwise, uh, you will never form um, a central object at the center. Um, but different uh, simulations um, from, from uh, various direct uh, collapse you know, various direct uh, cosmological direct collapse simulations indicate uh, that these conditions to, to form a, a supermassive object at the center uh, are much easier to realize than what has been previously thought. So, for instance, this is a, these are uh, different, uh, uh, the outcome of different uh, um, um, halo configurations from uh, Latif et al. in 2013, and they basically, in almost all cases, find um, that you form a supermassive object at the center. Um, <coughs> The same also for uh, Choi et al. In 2013, they demonstrate that it's possible to, possible to overcome the angular momentum barrier via uh, gravitational torques, the so-called bar within bars mechanism. And uh, yeah, so it, it, it looks like uh, um, you're able to, to, form, uh, to form a supermassive object at the center of, such a, of the direct collapse of a primordial gas cloud. Now, um, the computational modeling, I will briefly, uh, or to some extent, uh, show you what we are doing or we are not doing. So, in an ideal world, we would like to uh, model the full magnetohydrodynamics. And it means we, uh, because we want to model the dynamics of the stellar fluid, of course, we have to include general relativity, obviously, because of gravity. And once we form a black hole, um, uh, we uh, need full general relativity. Um, we need nuclear and neutrino physics. We uh, uh, need to have a nuclear equation of state because we have um, neutrino interactions. We have electron-positron pair production. We have uh, nuclear burning. And ultimately, we also uh, need a Boltzmann transport theory because um, uh, later during the late, later stages of the collapse, uh, electron-positron pairs annihilate and create uh, uh, neutrinos. Uh, and ultimately, this should also be modeled via some uh, neutrino transport scheme. Um, but unfortunately, this means if you want to model all that, you require massively parallel computers um, and a very sophisticated scheme. So that's uh, beyond the scope of our, uh, of our um, computation models so far. So what we are doing is we basically throw away the, uh, the magnetic fields. So we just uh, look at uh, the, the hydrodynamics. Um, we include full general relativity, um, and we approximate our uh, equa equation of state by, an, by a gamma law, you know, with the gamma equals 4 thirds um, um, adiabatic index to uh, take into account the uh, radiation pressure dominated uh, uh, pressure component. Um, and we also throw away uh, Boltzmann transport theory completely. So that now makes it uh, uh, feasible. So um, we, on uh, the simulations that we did, basically run on between 256 and 512 cores. Uh, we use adaptive mesh refinement, a technique called multi-blocks, and we have a high-resolution shock capturing finite volume scheme. And that all is, uh, for us, at least uh, straightforward to do. So just to quickly introduce how uh, numerical relativity works, 
So in principle, the Einstein equations give you uh, a prescription for uh, the metric, the full f uh, 4D metric, the full 4D space-time. And um, in order to evolve that from some kind of initial state, we basically uh, foliate the 4D space-time in terms of space-like hypersurfaces, sigma, uh, along some time-like vector field, TMU, um, as a so-called um, ADM decomposition, which uh, results basically in the three metric and the extrinsic curvature and the laps and shift gauge func functions. And uh, given some initial data on this initial slice here, we can evolve that forwards, forward in time. Uh, Anuvit, Deza, Misner, the three guys who, who basically did this. And um, it turns out, however, that this standard ADM decomposition and the ADM equations that you get, the evolution equation in that, in that form, are, are numerically unstable. So what we really in, uh, evolve are the Einstein equations in this uh, so-called BSSN form, or uh, recently what has been pro uh, what, what was proposed uh, was, a, was an addition, additional uh, variable which implements constraint damping, uh, the so-called Z4C formalism. And this formalism basically introduces a bunch of extra variables which uh, ensure that it uh, becomes numerically uh, stable. So um, this, is, this is our typical grid setup that we are having. So, for instance, this here is from a simulation where uh, where we uh, collapsed um, uh, a Wolf Rayet star. So, not a supermassive star, but just just a massive star. Uh, you see here that we have uh, different uh, levels of refinement, and uh, the black hole is sitting on the finest level. This here is from a, a, a vacuum binary black hole simulation. Again, the black holes sit on the finest refinement levels, and we have. Uh, do these boxes move around and track track the black holes? Exactly the same is happening in my simulations, uh, where uh, we dynamically form these two black holes. We also have uh, the boxes following the black holes in the central density uh, regions of the fragments. Now, um, the space time is approximated by uh, by finite differences. So the spatial derivative operators that we have, are high order finite difference operators. <coughs> Uh, I mentioned before already that, that our hydro scheme is a finite volume scheme. We use the HLLE Riemann solver and uh, so-called Wiener 5 reconstruction. Um, the coupling between space-time and uh, fluid evolution is done with a method of lines, and we apply a fourth order on a Kuda scheme. Method of lines basically means that you split um, the time integration from the spatial discretization, so you view that independently. So you can view, you can view your, you know, you can just say that your field u is, a fu is equal to function the right hand side this is the right hand side and this contains all kinds of spatial derivatives that means you can treat this this as an ode basically so you can view uh, your 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 time update as an ode if you just ignore the fact that you know here you also have uh, spatial derivatives just yeah uh, no, we. Uh, I mean, uh, it depends. Um, what we have is, I mean, we use an, an AMR subcycling in time, but we don't have, we don't adaptively uh, adjust the time stepping during the simulation. So, yeah, the finest grids are evolved more frequently than the coarser grids because of a current Friedrich Levy condition. Okay, so uh, another modeling extension that we had, um, or that we recently implemented. Um, is uh, our so-called multi-blocks. Here, the idea is that you cover the simulation domain not just by one Cartesian grid, which is capable of AMR, but also by curvy linear grid patches. And this has, has the advantage that you can uh, adapt to the problem symmetry, and especially for the gravitational wave zone, for the far gravitational wave zone, uh, which is of spherical symmetry. You want to exploit the symmetry and employ these um, spherical grids, which obviously... Uh, uh, of a much better scaling because a Cartesian grid would scale with uh, n cube points, whereas uh, the spherical grid only scales linearly with the, uh, with the number of radial points while maintaining a fixed angular resolution. That's really what you want. Uh, uh, from one patch to... No. Uh, so we, we uh, the, the um, um, ghost zones are updated via um, uh, Lagrange interpolation in our case, or in, t uh, in case of the hydro variables with some uh, Eno operator or Wino operator, uh, but we don't see any instabilities there. Yeah, 
diffuse it for you to the match? Uh, not really. It's 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 okay. I mean, we to be to be honest. Um, um, most of the time, we uh, we actually uh, uh, keep the uh, hydro evolution on the central Cartesian grid, and uh, only the gravitational fields are evolved out uh, uh, are crossing these. What I'm saying is, in the overlap regions mm -hmm. where you have where you switch from one grid to the other, mm -hmm. it's going to be very diffusive for fluid quantities. Well, I mean, it stuff moves from one cell to another readily. When that's that's right, but but I mean for. I, well, for the for the space-time evolution variables, um, there's certainly some amount of noise generated, but I don't see that anything becomes diffusive. I mean, what what do you mean in that? Oh, okay. What I mean is that you have if you have an overlapping grid, mm -hmm. and you're trying to connect how much fluid is in this cell here with this other representation mm -hmm. of the same region, mm -hmm. whose cells have a different shape and only mm -hmm. partially overlap. Mm -hmm. So. In order to make the reinterpolation onto the new grid, you will necessarily mix properties of fluid here with fluid there. But there's no fluid. I mean, we, we this is just vacuum on this interpatch boundary. Okay, I thought this also applied to your fluid calculation. Uh, yes, but uh, okay, okay. Uh, then, then there's a. It also extends to our fluid calculation, but we're not making a, a, a extensive use of that. So in in, in this in these models. Um, yeah, you yeah. don't care but, about But you're right. We would need to have some kind of refluxing schema. The thing is space time is fine. Yeah, yeah. The fluid is more quiet. Exactly. So how do you define location where this uh, transition occurs? Uh, on these, well, I mean, we have just uh, parameters which determines how, uh, you know, how large our Cartesian grid is and uh, we have to specify a certain ghost zone width or what do you mean? So how much matter is contained? Inside the innermost block. What so is here, the physical criteria that you use? Uh, this, this is, I mean, if you if you mean that, I mean, this is not an adaptive choice or, or anything. It's just uh, we set it up initially such that that uh, most of the dynamics occurs on this Cartesian grid. I mean, in the simulations that I will be showing, there's no matter being expelled to to the multi-block grid later on. So everything is really confined. Subsonic in those regions. And yeah. I mean, this is, there's pure vacuum here. There's nothing going on here. It's just space-time evolution, just the space-time fields, which are, uh, you know, gravitational waves, which are propagating outwards. Okay. Uh, just to give you an idea of how we extract gravitational waves. So, ideally, uh, gravitational waves are uh, uh, extracted at future null infinity. That's the conformal boundary, uh, outer boundary of space-time, scribe plus. Um, this is where uh, where really you can uh, identify unambiguously from the background space-time what a gravitational wave is. Unfortunately, of course, um, our computational domains are finite. Um, that means we only uh, we only simulate a subset of the entire space-time. Uh, we have to propagate uh, either there are two there, there are two different uh, ways. One standard way is to just introduce a, an artific artificial finite radius and say, okay, this is my gravitational wave. Um, another technique which we are using is uh, Cauchy characteristic extraction, which overcomes this problem. So the idea is to, uh, to uh, foliate space time in the wave zone along these uh, um, uh, null hypersurfaces. So instead of foliating space time in terms of uh, space, uh, space like hypersurfaces, we have now null hypersurfaces. Um, this allows the compactification along along the radio direction, and uh, allows us to place future null infinity on the computational grid. So waves are basically propagating along these these null rays instantaneously outwards, and we can compute radiation here, free of any uh, finite radius effects, um, and uh, also free of gauge effects because we actually transform through the uh, Bondi gauge to the gauge where a gravitational wave detector would also be. Uh, well, what, what a gravitational wave detector would also perceive. Um, yeah, so um, since um, the standard, uh, since uh, pure characteristic, so-called characteristic evolutions are not very well suited for uh, for strong field regions, what, uh, we are, what, what we are doing here is to couple the Cauchy evolution, that means the, the, the evolution where you um, um, where you have the, the, the source and the, uh, the matter um, evolution happening is, is coupled basically uh, via some finite 
radius world tube where you collect metric data, uh, which is then uh, subsequently evolved uh, uh, via uh, a subsequent uh, characteristic evolution out to scry plus to extract the gravitational, uh, gravitational waves at uh, scry plus, free of gauge and finite radius effects. So uh, we also usually perform convergence tests, uh, but I, I mean, I have a convergence test, but uh, I, I can show it uh, maybe afterwards for those who are interested. But main, the main work of all the convergence tests and testing the codes is really done in that paper where we implemented the multi-block scheme. Okay, so uh, this is our initial condition. So we start off with a rapidly differentially rotating marginally stable polytrope uh, modeled by gamma equals 4 third um, uh, adiabatic index. So these are the uh, input parameters. The initial data are described by these uh, three input parameters, the central density, uh, the axis ratio to, to define rotation, and uh, the degree of differential rotation. And um, since this guy is pretty rapidly rotating, it uh, has a quasi-toroidal shape. That means that, that the central density, the maximum density is off-centered. It's not at the center anymore. Differential rotation A is defined. I'm familiar with the T over W. Is mm -hmm. it the same thing? Or? No, no. So, uh, in, in, in the, uh, uh, when A becomes infinite, then you basically recover uniform rotation. So, and the, the smaller A, the, the more rapid. What is the specific implementation of actuality? That I don't know. I think, yeah, it should be, uh, it should be monotonic. I mean, we're not doing anything special here. I, have to, I would have to look it up. I mean, this is this is this is uh, uh, this, this is the, the the toroidal branch basically of of, of uh, these uh, equilibrium configurations that you can get from uh, this. Uh, uh, how's this? this uh, Hisachu's self-consistent field method, where you uh, solve for uh, for these initial conditions. Um, uh, this uh, is Newtonian stable, yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, so it it it, it will become it, it's it's destabilized once you add gr because you know gamma equals four third is is marginally stable and as as uh, when you uh, add gr then this has a destabilizing destabilizing effect and effectively reduces the the gamma. Stable. Stable to collapse, stable to, uh, radio perturbations or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Non-axisymmetric perturbations. Uh, that, well, I don't know. The, the thing is, um, if you you can, um, so there are, there are papers which try to investigate under which kind of conditions and what kind of uh, uh, um, perturbations or initial perturbations uh, these fluid configurations are unstable. So you really have to do numerical experiments. It's not, you know. So this this configuration turns out to be unstable against uh, non-exosymmetric perturbations. So just to give you a feeling of uh, of uh, physical units, so if you impose a 10 to the 6 uh, uh, um, solar mass supermassive star, then the central density would correspond to 10 to uh, uh, 2 grams per cubic centimeter. Uh, the radius would uh, extend to 0.A. The equatorial radius would extend to 0.A astronomical units. And uh, one uh, co-time unit of 1M would correspond to roughly five seconds. And um, so as I mentioned already, uh, um, Burkhard Sink in 2006 and 2007 looked exactly at this uh, model. And uh, he found that uh, this model is unstable to non exosymmetric perturbations. And what that means is that uh, these perturbations grow um, in amplitude, and eventually uh, the star fragments while it's collapsing into self gravitating components. And depending on the density perturbation, initial density perturbation that you impose, uh, 
uh, you get one one fragment or two fragments or even more fragments. Um, the the uh, the initial perturbations that we uh, or perturbation that we apply is uh, this kind of function here with uh, the M parameter, you select uh, uh, yeah, the, the M mode, the, 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 mode uh, the, uh, the mode of the initial density perturbation. Um, with an M equals one mode, you would expect uh, one, co uh, one collapsing, uh, one fragment to, f uh, to form. When with an M equals two uh, parameter, you would expect uh, two components that form, and that actually is also the case. Um, the initial uh, perturbation of uh, the initial amplitude of the perturbation is pretty small, so it has a relative uh, amplitude of 10 to the minus 5, um, and uh, nevertheless, that's sufficient to to trigger uh, to trigger these uh, well, because it's unstable against it. There will, will be some exponential growth in there, and eventually, uh, it uh, leads to the to the, the fra fragmentation into these self-gravitating components. Uh, with the dynamical time? So it depends. So uh, in the first model, the growth rate is 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 uh, is, is, is is pretty is pretty long. So uh, initially, you, in the simulations that I will show on the next slide, you will see that uh, that it takes some time to to pick up uh, um, or until until the the fragments uh, really form. Whereas in this case, where we uh, reduce the adiabatic index, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, the time scale to form a fragment is much uh, much faster. But the, the exact uh, um, how, how it exactly relates, I don't know. So um, what Burkhardt Sink did in 2006 and 2007 is basically look at these two models that I label M1 G1 and M2 G1. So he reduces he uses the collapse by uh, artificially reducing the pressure by uh, 10 to the minus 3, by reducing the uh, uh, polytropic scale. And um, he uh, put initially uh, on, the, uh, on the initial uh, density, density uh, distribution an M equals 1 mode and an M equals 2 mode. And then what we are doing now, motivated by, by um, electron-positron pair creation above a temperature of 10 to the 9 Kelvin um, that was observed by uh, Montero et al., we, we just play around with it and, and artificially reduce the uh, adiabatic, adiabatic index gamma to somewhat below uh, four thirds. So this would correspond to a change of 0.25%. And what you will get uh, for these three models is um, the same as what Burkhard Sink has found uh, in, the, uh, in 2006 already. Uh, we form one black hole. The reason actually why we repeated the simulations are because uh, uh, Burkhard Sink back then didn't have uh, didn't have uh, enough resolution yeah. and uh, also didn't have flux conser conservative uh, AM, uh, flux conservative AMR scheme and was even not uh, able to follow the collapse of of the two fragments that would form. So his simulation basically stopped before an apparent horizon formed. Um, so we repeated these simulations and we act actually find uh, that in, in each case you form one black hole. In one case, you formed one fragment. In the other case, you fi uh, find two fragments. And then finally, in, in the model where you reduce uh, the adiabatic index, you actually uh, see that uh, the collapse happens fast enough in the, diff in the two uh, fragments that form so that two uh, black holes form in each of the fragments. So this is the first model um, where we have an, gamma, uh, an M equals 1 perturbation and where we keep the polytropic index at gamma equals 4 thirds. You see here the central density evolution. Here you see the gravitational wave signal. Um, so the uh, non-exosymmetric perturbation uh, initially doesn't, doesn't show up, but it's picking up. It's growing exponentially. And eventually, the uh, maximum density increases. And now you see that a fragment forms, and this fragment collapses down to a black hole. And the black hole finally settles, settles to a spin of about 0.9, dimensionless spin parameter, and about 85% um, of the mass ends up in this black hole. And here you can actually see the first time when you find an apparent horizon, the mass of the black hole is about 2.5 m, and our initial uh, data has a mass of about 7.1 m. So, there is the total mm -hmm. So uh, the gravitational wave signal is just the typical uh, uh, ring down signal. So you see 
the spike that uh, occurs once the black hole forms, and then, then a damped ring down signal. We're actually showing just the L2 M2 mode, which is the dominant mode. All right, in the case where you have uh, an M equals 2 density perturbation, you uh, initially get the same uh, behavior. The mode needs to grow once it has uh, uh, reached sufficiently high amplitudes, uh, you basically uh, start to see that two fragments are forming. It takes a while. All right, now, now the two fragments are forming, but before uh, the individual fragments collapse to a black hole, uh, you get a central r runaway collapse, and uh, you again just form one single black hole. So in this case, the gravitational wave signal is a bit more pronounced because the M equals 2 structure uh, emits uh, gravitational radiation much more efficiently. Um, again, here at the very end, uh, you end up with a spin of about 0.9 and again, approximately 85% uh, ends up in the, uh, in the black hole. So now comes the more interesting configuration. So here we uh, again have an M equals 2 density perturbation, but we have uh, reduced the adiabatic, adiabatic index. Collapse is now, uh, of course, much, much faster. You see that the entire star also collapses as a whole. Now uh, the two fragments form, and you form uh, in each of the fragments an apparent horizon. So you have two black holes which orbit each other. The gravitational wave signal now resembles the, uh, uh, the shape of, of a uh, typical in spiral merger ring down signal that you also uh, know from uh, binary black hole merger simulations. And again, uh, the mass is, is approximately 85% of the uh, initial mass, and um, the spin is 0.9 approximately. Julian's comment earlier. In this, you don't have accretion onto the central black hole. No. No. Well, okay, no, we have. I mean, here we have accretion in the very end. But both times the no, 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 no. That, that's completely. I mean, not yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, yeah. But the gas is implicitly cold, cold, cold by. It's it's and there's no dissipation here at all. Uh, yeah. It falls the black hole. Well, there's, there's, it fall, there's, there's, there's some, some matter, uh, lower angular momentum matter, falling in, uh, into the black hole. But uh, in the final stages, the accretion rate uh, uh, is, is fairly low. So uh, if you measure the, the mass of the apparent horizon, it does not, uh, does not uh, grow anymore. Like or a very, very small, so very fraction of the matter has too much angular momentum to fall within the horizon. Which fraction? Yeah. Uh, I mean, if what fraction? How much? Uh, Fifteen percent. Uh, uh, if you have no, 80, uh, eighty-five percent of the mass is ending up. In ends up. So okay, this is a very low angular momentum. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it, not one hundred percent. Is it because of the? Uh, no. Let, let's put it this way. I mean, the, the black hole also has has a rapid spin. I mean. The, the initial configuration is also rapidly spinning, but uh, it does not, it, yeah, it's, it's not enough to, to, uh, to uh, get a stable, stable orbit. Small angular momentum, how do I put it? An angular momentum that's small at large radius is big at small. <laughs> <laughs> right. so, uh, in order to have 85% of the mass actually fall within the horizon, without any mechanism for angular momentum transport, without viscosities, internal stresses, and so on, means that basically it was a very low angular momentum configuration. Yeah, I guess he has some gravitational torques, right? Because it forms this bar mode. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the, that's the right. So you could yeah. ask how much of the angular momentum yeah. goes out in the waves. Because that's yeah. the only other place it can go. That's right. You mean in gravi gravitational waves? Yeah. Uh, that you can actually measure, but, uh, but um, I have the number also somewhere, but uh, since the uh, I don't I don't think it's it's that big, so yeah, it's mostly tiny. Yeah. Yeah, pretty inefficient way of doing it. Yeah. Right. Just to compare the different uh, different um, uh, different models, so uh, 
uh, most most interesting is basically uh, the gravitational wave signal. So you clearly see that uh, in the case where you form a uh, uh, binary black hole system, the gravitational wave signal is, uh, has many more cycles, uh, has much higher amplitude, and that effectively will, will means that you will see this uh, this signal uh, much further much further out. Whereas the other two uh, cases, in the, in the case where you only have an M equals one. Uh, fragment forming, the amplitude is fairly low. Here the amplitude is somewhat larger because you have an M equals 2 fragment, which is radiating more efficiently. Five, yeah, five seconds. Yeah. Yeah, depending, I mean, depending on the mass that you impose. Yeah. yeah, here this is just to summarize uh, well, okay, this, okay, I thought that uh, that I had also here the numbers for the initial, but uh, we, we saw that already on the on this one uh, plot. Okay, now the uh, the question, um, how well, uh, can we actually detect these gravitational waves uh, that are radiated from, from these configurations? Um, and depending on the mass, uh, it's in the decihertz or millihertz band, and that, of course, means we uh, need to uh, look at uh, LISA or even the DeSigo and Big Bang Observer observatories, which are uh, anticipated uh, observatories, or they, at least DeSigo, uh, I think the Japanese are kind of keen of doing it, uh, even though it looks like, I mean, if ELISA is not, not possible to, uh, <laughs> if, you don't, if you can't even put ELISA into orbit, then uh, it looks very uh, ambitious to put like these, you know, these four uh, detectors uh, up there. Anyway, uh, so because uh, these supermassive stars have existed uh, uh, very early in the universe, uh, uh, we need to uh, take into account the, uh, the expansion and uh, need to compute the luminosity distance. And in doing so, we impose a lambda CDM cosmology and uh, take the latest uh, Planck data. And um, what you see here, is basically this, uh, the gravitational wave spectrum for uh, this configuration, which forms a binary black hole system. So here, for a mass of 10 to the 4 uh, solar masses, uh, rescale to a distance of, uh, of, about, of, of z equals 15. And you also see the detector noise curves. And what you see here is uh, that uh, ELISA uh, would not see it. That's also why we picked the SIGO and the Big Bang Observer, because uh, <laughs> These two observatories uh, could see uh, could see uh, the signal, and if you uh, impose different or play around a bit with the numbers, then you find that that um, a low mass supermassive star on the order of 10 to the 4 solar masses would be visible um, if it's optimally oriented to the detector out to a redshift of z equals 25. A 10 to the 6 solar mass supermassive black hole would uh, only be seen out to z equals 16. Um, and then if you is impose a random orientation uh, to the detector, you get somewhat reduced uh, uh, distances. But uh, yeah, with, with uh, the Big Bang Observer and DeSigo, you would be able to, to see these guys. And the latter would be visible also with the little, right? The 10 plus 6. Uh, this one? Uh, no, I mean, this, this curve is simply not... Uh, yeah, but the frequency, no, but the six solar masses, yeah. the frequency of emission should be much lower. Where the two curves, the blue and the red curve, should almost converge at low frequency yeah. below ten. That six. yeah, that's that's true. But but I mean, as you uh, as you sh okay, you shift this up s somewhat. Well, I mean, I, I was not if I pl I played around with that, but. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, this signal moves if, if you if you have a higher mass moves of course in that direction it also some, somewhat moves up in amplitude but uh, but it didn't work out if you impose a signal to noise ratio of eight for uh, the minimum uh, signal to noise ratio of eight for detection then it didn't work out so I was not able to to uh, to get that out the, the point is that the, the sensitivity for your ELISA and uh, you know the cycle video is almost the same yeah here. But <laughs> no, no, yeah, well, I, I don't. I don't see the point. I mean, I, uh, so that, that, that's ten to the four, right? 
Mass. This is 10 to the 4, yeah. If you ship, yeah, you, you would move it over here, that's right. That's, that's right, but the amplitude would still, I mean, the amplitude would not, not, uh, not uh, be sufficiently high to enter this band. Now, the thing is, so the maximum detectability of 16 and 13 that you're quoted mm -hmm. there is for the cycle. Mm -hmm. Right? But if the two curves are similar, Order of well, okay, uh, I see. I see what you mean. Yeah, it's but 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 well, it still didn't work out. So yeah, I mean, uh, the blue line it's, it's the light blue line that's the source, and the dark blue line is the detection. So as you see at low frequencies, the light blue line is two orders of magnitude. No matter how far you shift it to the left, it still doesn't make it. Even if you move it up. What he's saying. Yeah, the frequency goes down toward. Mm -hmm. But but, it, uh, well, I I uh, I played around with that and uh, well, I see I see the point, but yeah. Also, all right. So uh, the final question is, of course, how likely is that to happen? So uh, in order to, uh, to, um, to form a binary black hole system, we requ require rapid differential rotation. We need to uh, reduce the pressure uh, or the uh, um, in, uh, adiabatic index gamma below 4 thirds. And we also need to impose an M equals 2 density perturbation, um, uh, therefore, f for fragmentation to happen. Um, so the first point. Uh, primordial gas clouds usually carry uh, substantial amounts of angular momentum, so that doesn't seem to be a problem that you have uh, a sufficiently rapid rotation. Uh, uh, you also, during the collapse, eventually encounter temperatures of 10 to the 9 Kelvin, uh, so that electron-positron pair cr uh, creation or pair production sets in and, uh, and uh, destabilizes the star and raise, uh, lowers the adiabatic index to below 4 thirds, even though, of course, we need to repeat these simulations with, uh, with more realistic equation of state because this is, of course, just an, an hoc assumption. And uh, depending on metallicity uh, and so on and so forth, you can also uh, uh, get a thermal bounce rather than having, uh, having um, a collapse to black hole. We don't know. I mean, I, there's different. There are different. There are different. There, there's a different. There's there's different regimes where you have. So it, it, it looks like you need differential, uh, different, uh, certain degree of differential rotation, and uh, sufficiently amount of uh, uh, angular momentum. Um, but the parameter space, exactly where the boundary is, nobody knows. So uh, one has to has to investigate that numerically. Basically. Well, I mean, it must be unstable to the m equals m equals two mode, right? I mean, to form two frames. No. Uh, so uh, the the point that you have an m equals um, uh, the, the, that you uh, may develop an m equals two density perturbation uh, could be likely because you have uh, you have um, uh, in your primordial gas cloud. Um, I think Choi et al. in 2013 they have uh, they have found that that uh, this uh, the structure that you or the, the central object that forms has uh, developed some some sort of m equals two structure. In any case, you would expect that you uh, that you have some random perturbation initially. It's not uh, perfectly spherically symmetric. Um, since uh, since it was found at least for this model that the m equals one and m equals two modes grow at the same speeds speed and are the fastest modes, you would expect that if you have a random uh, density perturbation initially, that one of these two modes would uh, would show up in the very end. And uh, yeah, depending on whether whether you have an m equals two bias or an m equals one bias in your uh, initial random perturbation, you would see uh, see. Um, Fragmentation in two, two, uh, or yeah, two, two components, or only in one component. But this again needs to be investigated because, uh, yeah, don't know. All right, and that concludes it already. So. Uh,
supermassive stars can be a pathway for seeding massive black holes at large redshifts. Uh, in order to form a supermassive black hole binary, you uh, uh, require rapid differential rotation. You need to lower the adiabatic index. You need to impose an m equals 2 density perturbation. And then finally, finally, the gravitational waves can be seen up to z equals 25 for DeSigo or the Big, uh, Big Bang Observer. Um, and also, uh, all the codes that we are using are publicly available as part of the Einstein toolkit, so you're free to download them and try it uh, try yourself. All right, thanks. So have you thought about putting in radiation? Because if, if I look at this, it's going to be very cool. It's a large object. Is it possible that JWST can detect such things? Uh, we haven't looked at this, and we, we did not. Scaling. If you, you know how much is being accreted, you know the radiation has to be radiated. Mm -hmm. You know the effective size. You can do almost the back of the envelope well, calculation. It doesn't have to be radiated. <laughs> it can be right. It can be sucked into the black it can hole. Be trapped. Yeah. But if you're going to be most optimistic, it's going to be radiated. Right. But if, with this much mass and this small a volume, the optical depth will be very large, and trapping will probably be big. Well, again, you that's a, just generically when the accretion rate is greater than Eddington, you have strong photon trapping, and this is very super Eddington. I mean, the, the lifetime of any of these objects is extremely short. Yeah, it's a thousands of seconds. Yeah, no. It, it, uh, well, once it collapses. But, but I mean, just I don't know the numbers. I'm going to invent some numbers. You know, if this is a uh, hundred times as luminous as a Type 1a supernovae. Even if it only lives for a few thousand seconds, JWST will see these things. If, if there's enough of them, it'll see them flickering on and off. And that'll be your characteristic signature. Now, I don't know if that's even a relevant number but or not. It's in not terms bad. of the photons that escape, it might be that what's produced while it's being assembled is greater than what's let out while yeah. it collapses. But that'll be very difficult to tell that it's this particular type of thing. So. Don't you have this around this I thought that um, he was pulling the star around well, it's a sort of star, but has a very mm -hmm. short lifetime. And most of the mass goes into the black hole. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you form, you form a. Yeah, that's a different with one. But it's a huge mass. So, so where's the optical depth of one in, uh, say, after the collisions? Is it? I have no clue. I mean, I have completely focused on gravitational waves and. Uh, yeah. I mean, one way to scale the characteristic radius, the R E, was how many gravitational radii? The, the, which one? The Your R E. Uh -huh. How many gravitational radii? Uh, the, the so uh, let's see. Let's <coughs> give, give an easy way of getting a sense of scale. So the initial equatorial radius was about okay. 0. 0.11, So it's about a thousand R G. So it's 10 to 13, uh, so about 100 RG. Yeah. So this is a very compact configuration to begin with. Uh, you have 10 to the 6 solar masses squeezed inside a volume with a radius of 100 gravitational radii. Okay. That's very, very dense, very, very optically thick. And you have to do something special to assemble this. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, this 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 evo evolves right from. I mean, uh, initially it is not as dense, and it, it starts to evolve and uh, cools and contracts. And I mean, we we had to pick in order to make it collapse already a configuration which is uh, which is on the onset of collapse. You started earlier. It would have taken far too long. To yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how, how does this scenario relate to this uh, the direct collapse? black hole formation scenario of not a you, you have to skip it just that. So let's say you I mean, have is, this, is this a, a, a stage of that, essentially? Uh, or is you can think of it. I mean, this would be the last stage in some sense. Um, I mean, you have to get to that. I mean, you have to get to some configuration of that type yet, which, as far as I know, there is no analytical nor numerical uh, study that get to these uh, regions. You have some uh, you have some estimates, I think that Mitch analytically has done the or the best analytical estimates, but here there are very there are many wiggles. Mm -hmm. This is uh, much denser than the 
Father's no, no, yes. I mean, what, like uh, you know, what I'm saying, no, is, uh, what I'm saying is the type. If these conditions are related somehow yeah. to, uh, I mean, as far as I know, but maybe your simulations show this. Region. I don't think that you can resolve no, point one. Yeah, so as far as I know, this could be the last stage, yeah. but it's not. Clear. There is a huge gap between yeah. what we have seen analytically or numerically about the yeah. collapse. Yeah. Uh, so you have to. This imagine. is another one of situations where there's a you're missing the intermediate scale yeah. physics. But I mean, this is not uh, six years ago at last meeting here. I remember going around and asking people <laughs> exactly this. So. Back then, the situation was um, you have dark collapse because gas goes in, and then by magic, post metallic stability, you form a black hole. Full stop. This was the one sentence repeated in all papers in this game. So, at least now we have some math, we have some information, so we have improved. So, there is an intermediate phase that we don't know. Anyway, I also have a question. And it goes back to Tamara's uh, point. I mean, if you, in principle, if you have zero moment, so you're talking about the rationalization. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just no rotation. This is the best situation for loss. Yeah, exactly. But but then of this this yeah, I mean the reason why we don't pick it is uh, because we were interesting in the, interested in this uh, non exosymmetric instability. And but but when you say we require um, rather differential shared, so when you say mm -hmm. we require mm -hmm. rather differential shared, can you qualify the word require? For you require this for? It seems like you're expecting that this is a unique model, but we require that. Yeah, well, I mean, there's again, I th there's there's a certain branch, a certain branch of uh, initial configurations where you, where this setup applies. But there are other other uh, uh, setups. Uh, for instance, yeah, if you have no rotation, then then this guy immediately collapses. I mean, it's unstable to begin with against. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Is it required really for interest in gravitational wave production? Required for forming. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And for having this uh, very large gravitational wave signal. Is there any mass left over to the black holes to activate and grow? Uh, so in this particular scenario, it seems like the accretion rate is fairly uh, low. So if I look at the at the apparent horizon mass as a function of time, uh, which indicates uh, you know the, the is, is a quasi local measure for the. Uh, the motivation was to explain supermassive, uh, the supermassive black holes at the LA. Well, well, it's yeah, yeah. This was the broader motivation, yeah. So basic, basically, I'm forming two massive black holes, which, and this is basic. I mean, the study itself uh, basically just shows that that uh, it's possible to form from a single fluid body two black holes. Uh, if you say that this is a supermassive star, then the black holes end up with uh, supermassive uh, masses, uh, uh, of course, and. Uh, that uh, uh, yeah, this was just to, to to put it in a in in, in some physical context. And in this, well, I mean, in this room, most people are happy with just forming one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm a numerical relativist, so for me, it's a. So just, I'm I'm still interested in this. What happens before you get to this point? Because mm -hmm. I think there's a whole lot of. Uh, well, one one thing in terms of forming the black hole, uh, one thing I don't really understand completely here is you have, what is the effect of winds over a long enough period of time. I mean, there that's going to depend. This is where your metallicity issue becomes important. And so it's a lot of details there, I guess, that I have no understanding of. So, so I think, so I read, read what else does. there was some paper by, so there, there, there was there are some, there were two papers which were looking at this recently. So Inai, some Japanese guy, Inayoshi, I don't remember his name. I think it was Inayoshi. And he was looking at uh, positional instabilities, whether, I mean, the positional instabilities uh, grow or, 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 or can shut down the, this, these rapid accretion downstreams that are necessary to uh, form such a star. And also there was some other Japanese guy who was looking at radiative feedback. And he was, both of these papers were basically showing that this is no problem. Hmm? Ah, yeah, yeah. But I'm not an expert on that, so. Uh, Stability is to, the pulsations are to dis disturb this, disturb exactly. this, uh, the, the object? Yeah, to, to. Uh, Stable? Yeah, think of it as yeah. giant. Mm -hmm. Or. I think that the limit on the mass, the 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.